أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحسن عماه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وخاتم المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين اضحب الله عنهم الرسا وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى واللانة الدائمة الباقية لعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم بغاص بحقوقهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم إنما المؤمنون الذين آمنوا بالله ورسوله ثم لم يرتابوا وجاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم في سبيل الله أولئك هم الصادقون صلوات فرنا يكبارا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى في سورة هجرات سورة نمبر 49 آية 15 talks about the true definition of a believer and he says the believers are those who believe in Allah and his messenger ثم لم يرتابوا and after that they do not ever entertain doubts about their beliefs and then they struggle in the way of Allah through their wealth as well as their own lives they are willing to give, give up everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are the truthful uh, people the truthful believers keeping this ayat in our mind we have been discussing the Shi perspective on the companions, the wives, and the family of the Prophet, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In our discussion, we have been very clear about it, that when we look at this issue, that did the Prophet of Islam, you know, leave a legacy behind as a means of uh, guidance for the Muslims or not. And we basically discussed this matter last night in the light of the hadith known as Hadith Saqalain, the hadith about two precious or two important things. And we saw that there are two versions of it. The first one says, Kitabullah wa Sunnati, the book of Allah and my Sunnah. And the second says, Kitabullah wa Ahlu Bayti, or Kitabullah wa Itrati, which means the book of Allah and my family. And we saw that the first version is actually based on what is known as weak hadith. It is a fabricated one. And it is not even found in any of the six canonical um, books of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah as far as hadith is concerned. The second version, which talks about the Prophet leaving two things behind, a source of guidance, the Quran on one hand, and the Ahlul Bayt, the family on the other hand, this is to be found is in three of the six canonical books of the Hadith of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And the version which was there from uh, Sahih Muslim, narrated by Zaid bin Arqam, Actually, the Prophet three times at the end emphasizes this point where he reminded the Muslims that I remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regard of my family. But yet we see that the Muslims from day one after the demise of the Prophet, the Muslims shunned the Ahlul Bayt. They put them on the side and they started ignoring them. And tonight I would like to present to you some of the historical perspective on this issue so that our own youths and our own people can be more familiar with history. And hopefully, you know, others who are not necessarily from the Shri background when you discuss with them. These are some of the issues that I'm trying to present to you 
based on the sources which will be acceptable from the Shi'i as well as Sunni uh, points of view, as far as the sources are concerned. Do not let me talk about, uh, start with the discussion about ignoring the Ahlul Bayt when it comes to the narration of the Ahadith. Last night I mentioned that Bukhari, who was contemporary of the uh, ninth and the tenth Imams of Ahlul Bayt, when he compiled his book on Sahih Bukhari, he doesn't have a single hadith from our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al Sadiq. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ala Muhammad Muhammad But let me just extend that. Maybe you know they will say, well, sixth Imam is a sixth Imam. He had not seen the, the Prophet. Let us look at this issue of, you know, how many ahadiths are there in the classical works of hadith of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah from Imam Ali alayhi salam. When you look at the ahadith in the Sunni compilations, you will see that the number of ahadith quoted from Abu Huraira reached to the number of 5,374 ahadith. So Abu Huraira is a narrator of 5,374 ahadith. On the other hand, if you look at the number of ahadith quoted in those books from Imam Ali alayhi salam, the number is only 586. Look at the difference. Abu Huraira has quoted 5,374 narrations in the book that they have compiled. And what, we, what they have from Ali is only 586. So the narrations from Amir al muminin are just, you know, under 11% of the quotations that they have from Abu Huraira. Whereas Abu Huraira only saw the Prophet in the last three years of the Prophet's life. Whereas Ali was in the house of the Prophet from the age of five till the last moments of the Prophet. Ali lived with the Prophet for 34 years. Abu Huraira saw Rasulullah only three years. And yet they have quotations from Abu Huraira. But when it comes to Ali bin Abi Talib, the number of ahadith that they have is less than 11% of what they have quoted from Abu Huraira. And this is where we, we see Abu Huraira was a companion. He was a Sahabi only. He would see the Prophet in the masjid or outside. Ali was a family member. He was from the Ahlul Bayt. He would not only see the Prophet outside, but even out, you know, in his house, in the house of the Prophet, in the privacy, as well as in, the, in, in his, his, his own house when Rasulullah would come and uh, visit Ali and Fatima. And this is where we see that there was a, a deliberate attempt to ignore Ahlul Bayt, especially when it comes to the person of Ali bin Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wa salam. Salawat, Prana Nekbala. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. 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 Not only on them in the matters of hadith, even when it comes to the issue of tafsir of the Quran, based on the narrations that we have, the Prophet, in one of the last will that he made with Amir al-Mu'minin, you know, Ali then decided, based on that wasiyat of Rasulullah, to sit down af after the, soon after the wafat of Rasulullah to compile the Quran in a chronological order. I would like to make it clear, we are not saying that the present order is wrong, no. Ali basically decided to compile the Quran in a chronological order, in the order of the sequence of the revelation. So he would start with Surah, um, you know, when we look at the issue of Iqra bi'isma rabbika, and not, not with Surah Fatiha. Ali did not only compile the uh, Quran known as Mus'haf Ali in that way, but he also wrote what we call marginal notes in the Hashia, you know, like footnotes, where in cases of many, many verses, he will say, where was this verse revealed? When was it revealed? What was the occasion where this ayat was revealed? And who are the individuals that the Quran is talking about? This ayat is referring to. 
And we see that we have a testimony from the Prophet himself saying that nobody knows among the Ummah Quran better than Ali bin Abi Talib. Let me narrate to you a narration from Imam Nisai as well as Muhibbuddin al Tabari in their book Khasais as well as Zakhair al Uqba and many other sources where a very prominent Sahabi by the name of Abu Sa'id al Khudari. He says that one day we were sitting outside waiting for Rasulullah to come and so that we can be in his presence and benefit from him. He said, then we saw him coming out while he was, hen, uh, while he was actually uh, holding a sandal in his hand where the strap of the sandal had broken. So he comes closer. He saw Ali and he gave it to Ali to amend this. Then he sat down with the Sahaba, with all of them, and Ali was there, you know, um, amending the, uh, the mending the um, the strap which was uh, broken in the sandal of Rasulullah. Then he says something. He says, "Inna minkum man yuqatilu ala ta'awil al-Quran kama qataltu ala tanzilihi." He says, among you, there is a person who will fight for the interpretation, ta'avil of the Quran, the way I fought for the tanzil and revelation of the Quran. Rasulullah fought the mushrikeen to prove that Quran is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says that there is some among you who will fight against the enemies for the true ta'awil and interpretation of the Quran. According to that narration, narration from Imam uh, Nasai, as well as Muhibbuddin Tabari, Abu Bakr immediately said, Ana huwa ya Rasulullah, Wallah is that, uh, or Rasul, or the Messenger of Allah, is it me? And the Prophet said, no. Then according to one of these two versions, Umar said, am I the one? And that is where Rasulullah says, bal khasifun na'al, no. But the one who is mending the sandal, and that was none other than Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam. Salawat for anayik wa rahmat. Muhammad Muhammad So according to this narration coming from the Sunni sources, the Prophet certifies Ali as somebody who knows the ta'wil of the Qur'an, the true interpretation of the Qur'an, and he will fight for that true interpretation. And so she, we, we shouldn't be surprised when we see Amir al-Mu'mineen, especially during the time of his Khilafat, where he, where he used to say, Saluni, Saluni, Qablan Tafqiduni. You know, ask me, ask me before you lose me. النسمة, by the one who split the grain and created the human soul. لو سألتموني عن أي آية If you ask me about any ayat whether it was revealed في ليلة أنزلت أو في نهار أنزلت whether it was revealed at night time or day time مكيها ومدنيها whether it was revealed in مكة or مدينة سفريها وحضريها whether it was revealed when the Prophet was in, in journey or when he was in Medina at home whether the ayat is abrogator or abrogated whether this is an ayat which is clear or which is an ayat which has an allegorical and symbolic meaning whether you ask me about any ayat where and when was it revealed or if you would like to know the ta'wil and the interpretation in, in, interpretation of that ayat I will definitely inform you about those ayat. So he is basically here now saying that I have complete grasp on the ayat of the Quran. I can tell you the true interpretation of it. And this is where we see that when Amir al-Mu'mineen compiled the Quran according to the chronological order, and then he came to the masjid and for Basically, he offered it to the Ummah, including the Khulafa and the leaders at the time. And they looked at it. As soon as they noticed that this is not only a Quran, 
it has a marginal notes where ali has talked about where when in what occasion and he also has the names of the people who have been referred to in those ayat and we know that there is ayat where allah has praised the mu'minin then there are ayat where allah has condemned some of the mu'minin as, as, as some of the muslims and since you know some of the names in those marginal notes of ali belong to the individuals now who were allies of the khilafat and therefore they say no ali we don't want your quran oh ali we don't want this quran the mushaf that you have compiled and this is where we have to realize that ali was not only ignored in the matters of hadith he was also ignored in the matters of the tafsir of the quran let me just give you one example of some of the sunni scholars who regret that decision by the leaders during the early days when they said thank you ali we don't want your mushaf in your quran one of them and this is from ibn abdul bar in his al istihab a very famous uh, biography of the sahaba he quotes a sunni narrator a reliable one by the name of muhammad bin sirin who says fabalaghani annahu kataba ala tanzilihi he says i've been told that ali compiled the quran based on the sequence of revelation walaw usiba dhalik alkitab la wujuda fihi ilm kathir if that compilation can be achieved if we can find it great knowledge will be found in it another very famous um, theologian history of the, uh, historian of theology among uh, al sunnah wal jamaa by the name of muhammad bin abdul karim al shahristani he says he was surprised by this decision of the of the leaders he says kayfa lam yatlubu jam'u ali bin abi talib why didn't they seek this compilation done by ali bin abi talib aw ma kana aktabu min zaid bin thabit was ali not better in writing than zaid bin thabit one of the scribes aw ma kana arab min saeed bin al as was not ali more an expert in arabic language than saeed bin al as aw ma kana aqrab ila rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam min al jamaa was he not closest to the prophet compared to the group of the companions and so these are the questions that even the sunni scholars raised about this decision and it is obvious that the decision of ignoring what ali was offering to the ummah was purely a political decision because they wanted to shun the ahlul bayt and put them on the side remember last night i quoted the hadith of saqalain from at tirmidhi where he said where he says that the prophet said that i'm living these two things kitab allah wa sun wa uh, kitab allah wa ahl ahl bayti or kitab allah wa itrati and then he said lan yaftariqa hatta yarida alayya al hawz they will never separate from one another until that they meet me by the fountain of kawsar on the day of judgment it is interesting to understand this you know the the link between ahlul bayt and the quran especially when we talk about ali as the head of the ahlul bayt and for this i would like to go to a very interesting um, narration from hakim nishapuri in his book al mustadrak al sahihain this is a sunni source again where he talks about a fellow by the name of abu thabit abu thabit was a former slave of abu zar al ghifari and he was there in the battle of jamal and he says that when i was in 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 basra in the battle of jamal when i saw aisha on the other side i got a little bit confused like many others is the haq on this side or is the haq on the other side then he says that when i then i you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me at the zuhur time now he doesn't describe what happened to him at that time But he said I was guided and then I was with Ali and I fought alongside Ali against his uh, opponents the rebels. Then when he came back to Medina 
He says, I went to visit um, um al Mu'mineen, Umm Salama, the wife of the Prophet, and he mentioned his confusion to her. She asked him, when you were confused at that time, what happened? Where were you when the hearts were perplexed? And he said, when I was supposed, I was where I was supposed to be when Allah guided me at the, uh, the Zuhr time. Upon hearing this, Umm Salama says to Abu Thabit, Ahsant, well done. Sami'tu Rasulullah yaqul, I have heard the Messenger of Allah saying, Aliyun ma'al Qur'an wal Qur'an ma'aliyin. I have heard the Prophet saying that Ali is with the Qur'an and the Qur'an is with Ali. La yaftariqani hatta yarida alayyu al-hawz. Qur'an and Ali will not separate from one another until they reach me by the fountain of Kawthar on the Day of Judgment. When the Prophet says that Ali is with the Qur'an and Qur'an is with Ali, what does he mean? Was he talking about physical closeness that as if, you know, Amir al-Mu'minin used to carry a Qur'an in his pocket or by his, you know, side, just like many Qaris of the Qur'an do? No. He was not talking about physical connection between Ali and the Qur'an. He was actually talking about the connection between the thoughts and the feelings and the emotions and the protest and the praises and the likes and the dis dislikes of Ali with the teachings of the Quran. Whatever he said and whatever he felt was reflection of the teachings of the Quran. There was symbiosis between Ali and the Quran. Quran was a book and Ali was the living Quran of his time. Salawat and since I have, you know, raised these issues, I would like to, you know, complete my discussion. It's not only in the matters of Hadith and the issue of Quran that they shun Ali, they kept Ali on the side. Of course, even in the main issue of Khilafat. And it's interesting that, you know, uh, our fellow Muslims, uh, the Sunni brothers and sisters, majority of them don't really read history. This is the problem. They just go with the sound bites that they hear from these preachers, that they, when they talk about the establishment of the first Khilafat in Saqifa, they say this is the example, a best example of democracy. Because now democracy is the good thing these days. And therefore they want to say that, oh, Islam also believed in this system of democracy. And what happened in Saqifa was based on uh, mutual cons uh, consultation and the democracy of the elders. In reality, this is totally false. Saqifa was neither a democratic process nor an exercise in consultation of the elders. The first Khalifa was selected by a few in a meeting held without any public notice. The Ummah didn't know about it. The people were not told about it. Banu Hashim, including Ali, were busy in the funeral rites of Rasulullah. And so when you talk about democracy, when you talk about consultation, democracy means all the people are, would be involved in it. Consultation means at, at least you get consult the people who are worthy of being consulted. All those who were potential candidates, majority of them were absent. Ali was not there in Saqifa. Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, was not there. Abdullah ibn Abbas was not there. Uthman was not there. Talha was not there. Zubair was not there. Saeed bin Abil Waqas was not there. Salman al-Farsi was not there. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was not there, Ammar bin Yasir was not there, Miqdad was not there, Abdurrahman bin Auf was, none of them were there. So what kind of, you know, consultation among the elders you are talking about? Amir al-Mu'mineen actually comments on this uh, system of Saqifa in his uh, poetry very beautifully, and I would like to, you know, present that to you. When he heard about this issue of Saqifa, one of the responses that he gave was about 
uh, through, through poetry where he says, فَإِن كُنْتَ بِالشُّورَ مَلَكْتَ أُمُورُهُمْ فَكَيْفَ بِهَذَا وَالْمُشِيرُونَ غَيِّبُوا If you gained authority over their affairs by consultation, how did it happen while those to be consulted were absent? Referring to the Khalifa, he says, you know, you gain, you are saying you gain the authority in, on the affairs of the Muslims by consultation, where those who were supposed to be consulted were absent. This is first argu argument. Then Ali says, إِن كُنْتَ بِالْقُرْبَى حَجَجْتَ خَصِيمَهُمْ فَغَيْرُكَ عَوْلَ بِالنَّبِيِّ وَأَقْرَبُ And if you overcome your opponents by the Prophet's kinship, then someone else is closer to the Prophet and more nearer to him. Because one of the arguments they used in Saqifah, the Muhajireen, the Quraysh, because the dispute was between the Ansar, the people of Medina, and the Muhajireen from Quraysh would come from Mecca. And the Muhajireen were saying to the Ansar that the Arab tribes would not accept anyone as a leader after the Prophet if he is not from Quraysh, because Rasulullah is from the tribe of Quraysh. And this is where the, the uh, Ali says, if you were, were able to gain an upper hand over Ansar because of you being from Quraysh, like Rasulullah, then you have to realize that there was somebody who was even closer to you than Rasulullah, to, to Rasulullah than yourself. Because Banu Hashim is not only Quraysh, they are actually from the family of Rasulullah. They are the, uh, the branch of, um, of Quraysh which, from which the Prophet uh, himself came. And so he says, we, we are closer to Rasulullah. And therefore, in Ahlul Balagha, he has a statement where he says, "Ihtajju bi shajara wa awaqu thamara." In Saqifa, they are argued on the basis of the tree, while they cut off and destroyed its its fruits. In in other words, what he was saying that you argued on this on the strength of the tribal relationship with of Quraysh, while you destroyed the fruits of that. Uh, a tribe known as Banu Hashim. And so when we look at this, we had to realize that, you know, there was no issue of democracy. There was no issue of consultation. This was a coup d'etat in a way. And let me just make a final po point before I get, go to another example, is that if Saqifa was really a good example of democracy, a good example of consultation among the uh, senior elders of the community, as they say, Ahlul Halli wal Aqd. Um, then the question is, why was this system of Saqifa never ever repeated in the Muslim history? Even the second Khalifa didn't come by, you know, what happened in, in, in Saqifa. He came to power on the basis of the will of the first one. The third Khalifa becomes the Khalifa based on the committee appointed arbitrarily by the second Khalifa before he died. It was only Amir al muminin who actually became a Khalifa on basis of the choice of the people. If you really want to see democracy in early history, you will have to look at the choice made by the Ummah after the murder of Usman, when people came themselves to the door of Ali bin Abi Talib. So they came to Ali, but they came 25 years late. They came on the day of Ghadir, but 25 years after the event of Ghadir. The second Khalifa himself, you know, he was the author of Saqifa, we would call, or architect of the architecture of the, of the Saqifa. Umar ibn Khattab himself, during his uh, Khilafah time, he said that I have been informed that some, some people say, when Umar dies, I will pledge allegiance to so-and-so. Because in Saqifah, what happened when they pledge allegiance to one person, then they said, this is done. And so Umar continues a statement where he says, well, no one should mis be misled by this. 
thinking that although the allegiance of Abu Bakr was falta, falta means it was a, uh, a surprise or a sudden event done without any consideration or planning. Of course, it was by surprise and Allah saved us from its evil. Now, if anyone wishes to copy it, I will cut his throat. MashaAllah, what type of a democracy we are talking about? That the Khalifa is saying that if you try to replicate or copy that, I will kill you. So there was no democracy there. There was no issue of, you know, proper consultation with those who were worthy of being consulted on this issue from the Sunni perspective. Let's see your salawat, please. <clears throat> This attitude of shunning the Ahlul Bayt, especially ignoring Ali ibn Abi Talib, it gained momentum and strength during the era of Banu Umayyah when they came to power with Muawiyah. And this continued where they basically went around actively you know, trying to erase the fadail of Amir al muminin all the ahadiths about his virtues, and try, started fabricating ahadiths against Ali and the family of Ali, where even now Abu Talib becomes a victim there in their propaganda. And this anti Ahlul Bayt movement of keeping the Ahlul Bayt on the side, this continued till the early days of Banu Abbas. And this is something I would like you to remember. Sometimes if you have a very cordial and uh, sensible discussion with your Sunni friends, you know, brothers and sisters in Islam, it is worth asking this, this question because what I'm going to say now is something which is no, not known by the majority, vast majority of Sunnis. I would say more than 95% of them do not know this history. If you ask them now, who are Khulafa Rashidin? Khulafa Rashidin means the rightly guided Khulafa. Ask them who are they? They will say, oh, there are four of them. They will say Abu Bakr, Umar, Usman, and Ali. What they do not realize that for a century and a half after the Shahadat of Ali, this was not the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The mainstream Sunnis those days, they were known as Uthmaniyya, as opposed to Alawiyya. Uthmaniyya also reflected the Umawi, you know, um, trend among the Sunnis. The belief of the mainstream Sunnis, Ahl Hadith, as well as Uthmaniyya, whatever level you want to use for them, for a century and a half, almost for two centuries, after the Shahadat of Am Amir al muminin when they used the term Khulafa Rashidun, or Khul Khulafa Rashidin, they only believed there were three Khulafa Rashidin. Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. Ali was not even recognized as a legitimate Khalifa. Because if they believed in the legitimacy, legitimacy of the Khilafat of Amir al muminin they said there would be a problem. Because then people like Talha, Zubair, and even Aisha would be categorized to be in the opposite side, which would be, would, would be wrong. And so the question is that if you study history, when did this change came about? When was this Definition of Khalifa Rashidin extended from three to four. And this is where you have to realize the credit goes to Ahmad bin Hanbal, the founder of the Hanbali uh, fiqh, who died in the year 241 of Hijra. Timeline is very important. It was on the insistence of Ahmad bin Hanbal, he started a campaign. That he said, when we are talking about Khulafa Rashidin, the rightly guided Khulafa, we have to include Ali in it. And actually, his own campaign in history is known as Tarbi'u Ali. Tarbi'u from Rubu'u. Arba. 
Tarbiyu Ali means to make Ali the fourth one. To extend this, def- this category of Khalafa Rashidin from three to four. And this is where we come to realize that, you know, there was a time for almost a century and a half to two centuries after Amir al-Mu'min al-Shahadat, where the belief of the Ahl al-Sunnah wal jamaah mainstream aqidah was that Khalifa Rashidin were only three, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. They would not even accord any legitimacy to the Khilafat of Amir al-Mu'min and Ali ibn Abi Talib and even when Ahmed bin Hanbal started this, it was not an easy process for him. There was a lot of opposition. I'll just give you one example here from a, a Hanbali scholar who has a book known as at tabaqatul uh, Hanbaliya, where he talks about the meeting of uh, Maritha bin Muhammad al-Himsi, who visited Ahmed bin Hanbal. And this is the time when he had already started this issue of making Ali the fourth Khalifa uh, Rashid. And this, this basically, um, you know, this, this fellow met Ahmed bin Hanbal and said, why are you doing this? Because when you do that, then you are actually criticizing the decision of Talha and Zubair because they were on the opposite side. And Ahmed bin Hanbal says, what you are saying is wrong. What, is, what have we to do with the fight between the two groups? We are not talking about their fighting, because of course, you know, they believe both, both sides were right. So this person, Mariza, he says that, you know, when, you, when we talk about Ali as the fourth Khalifa, basically you are certifying his Khilafat the way it was certified for those three who came before. So Ahmed bin Hanbal asked him then, what is the problem in doing this, in certifying the Khilafat of Ali, in in believing it to be a legitimate Khilafat? He says, well, you know, I'm following the opinion of Abdullah bin Umar, the son of the second Khalifa, who did not believe that Ali's Khilafat was legitimate. Ahmed bin Hanbal then responds to that by saying that, well, you may follow Abdullah bin Umar, the son of Umar, but I am following the opinion of Umar himself. Because Umar himself appointed Ali as one of the six members of the committee from whom the next Khalifa was going to be selected. So he said, based on that, Selection of Ali in that committee by Umar, it means according to Umar, Ali was capable of becoming a Khalifa. So I don't go with the opinion of his son, I go with the opinion of the father. And he says, secondly, Amir al Mu'minin himself accepted this title of Amir al Mu'minin for himself. So why should I take away that title from Amir as an Amir of Mu'minin? This is where we have to come, we have to realize, my brothers and sisters, you know, Amir al-Mu'mineen has gone through a lot of suffering. Not only in his lifetime, Ali was Muslim when he was alive, and Ali was Muslim even after his shahadat. When this majority of Muslims did not even accept his khilafat to be a legitimate khilafat, for almost a century and a half. And this is where when we look at the issues of what Banu, Banu Umayyah has have done, we cannot have any soft corner in our hearts for them. Because they were enemies of Ali ibn Abi Talib without any shed of doubt. And this has to be mentioned very clearly. We might compromise and we have to be discreet when we talk about others. We should talk about the controversial events in history, you know, but we have to use the civil language and we have to be careful in the choice of words, but there can be no soft corner for people like Muawiyah and Yazid. 
in the hearts of the Shias, and we also ask that in the hearts of the true followers of Khalifah Rashida. If you believe in Ali to be the Khalifa Rashid, then you cannot have this soft corner for those who are opposed to him, who actually, you know, try to shatter his image to the extent that they say he was a sinful person and Nawazubillah, they go to the extent of saying he was not even a true believer. And this is where we cannot have these words of Allahu Anhu for them. Azadara ne Hussain, Karabala ke maamle mein hum logon ke dil mein koi narm gosha nahi ho sakta hai. Banu Umayya ke silsile mein, Muawiyah aur Yazid ke silsile mein, Ali Abu Sufyan ke silsile mein, Ali Marwan ke silsile mein. Ali sirf apne zamane mein malzum, malzum, mazlum nahi the. Balki waqiyat e Karabala mein bhi Ali mazlum hai. Sirf Hussain mazlum nahi hai. آپ خود یزید کے ان اشعار کو یاد کریں کہ جب حسین ابن علی کا سر دربار میں لایا گیا ہے اس وقت اس نے جو غرور اور تکبر کے بنیاد پر جب وہ اہل حرم کو دیکھتا, دیکھتا ہے کہ اس کے سامنے پیش کیے گئے ہیں رسن بندی ہوئی ہے اسیر اور قیدی کی حیثیت سے ہیں اور حسین ابن علی کا سر جب لایا گیا اس نے جو اشعار پڑے ہیں اور جو باتیں کہی کی ہیں وہ اپنے مشرق آبا و اجداد کو آواز دیتا ہے کہ کاش آپ آج ہوتے زندہ اور دیکھتے کہ کس طرح سے ہم نے آپ کے قتل کا بدلہ لیا ہے یزید کے نانا اور مامو اور دوسرے رشتہ دار خاندان کے یہ قتل ہوئے تھے جنگ بدر میں اور ان کو قتل کرنے والے بنو حاشم تھے جناب حمزہ امیر المؤمین اور ایک اور بنو حاشم کے فرد اور یہ اسی طرف اشارہ کرتا ہے کہ ہم نے بدلہ لیا ہے اپنے مشرق آبا و اجداد کے قتل کا بدلہ ہم نے احمد مرسل محمد کے خاندان سے یہ بدلہ لیا ہے ہمیں لیکن اس منظر کو اس اشعار کو سننے کے بعد جناب زینب سے یہ برداشت نہ ہوا خصوصاً وہ ملعون جس طرح سے بے حرمتی کر رہا تھا امام حسین علیہ السلام کے سر کا اور جس طرح سے اس نے یہ اشعار پڑھنے شروع کیے ہیں جناب زینب کھڑی ہو جاتی ہیں اور انہوں نے جو خطبہ پیش کیا ہے ہم کئی سال پہلے آپ کے مرکز میں اس خطبے کو ہم نے تفصیلی طور پہ اس کے تاریخی پس منظر کو بھی پیش کیا ہے اس میں آخر میں جناب زینب کہتی ہیں کہ تم بھول رہے ہو یزید قرآن کی اس, اس آیت کو کہ جہاں خدا فرماتا ہے کہ اگر ہم کافروں کے رسی میں ڈھیل دے دیتے ہیں تو یہ نہ سمجھے کہ خدا ان سے راضی ہے بلکہ ایک وقت ان قریب آئے گا کہ خدا وند عالم اس رسی کو جب تیزی کے ساتھ کھینچے گا تب تمہیں معلوم ہوگا تمہارا عشر کیا ہوگا اور آخر میں خطبے کے اینڈ میں کہتی ہیں وہ حسب کا بلّہ حاکمن و بے رسول اللہ حسیمن و بے جبرعیل وحیرن تمہاری اتنی کافی ہے کہ قیامت کے دن خدا حاکم ہوگا جج ہوگا رسول اللہ شکایت لے کے آئیں گے تیرے خلاف اور جبرائیل رسول اللہ کی شکایت میں گواہ بن کے آئیں گے اور اس وقت نہ صرف تجھے بلکہ جنہوں نے ان کام کو کیا تھا سقیفہ سے جنہوں نے یہ موقع فراہم کیا تھا تمہارے لیے فرماتی ہیں وہ سیا لمو من سب وہ مکھن کا میں رقاب المسلمین انہیں بھی معلوم ہوگا جنہوں نے تمہارے لیے یہ راستہ ہموار کیا تھا اور تمہیں مسلمانوں کے گردن پر مسلط کیا تھا ان بیسا لالمین بدلا وہ بہت ہی برا دن ہوگا ظالمین کے لیے اور تب معلوم ہوگا ایکم شر و مکان و عضل سبیل 
तब तुम्हें मालूम होगा कि तुम्हारा ठिकाना कितनी कितनी बुरी जगह होगा और तुम्हारा रास्ता कितना गुमराई का रास्ता था फिर चैलेंज करती है अली के बेटी यजीद के दरबार में ये जुरात देखे आप वकीद खई तक यजीद तुम्हें जितनी भी प्लानिंग करनी है कर ले जितनी मेहनत करनी है कर ले व ना सिर्फ जहदक अपनी पूरी मेहनत लगा इस सिलसिले में फवल्ला वहीना लेकिन खुदा की कसम तुम हम लोगों के जिक्र और याद को लोगों के दिल से मिटा नहीं सकते हो और जो वही हमारे खानदान में हमारे नाना पर नाजिल हुई थी जिसको तुम आज जुटला रहे हो तुम उस वही को खत्म नहीं कर सकते हो और तुम्हें कभी भी तुम्हारे जो अजाइम है वो तुम हा, तुम्हें हासिल नहीं होगा और तुम पर ये जो दाग लग चुका है कोशिश के बावजूद भी तुम इस तुम इसे खत्म नहीं कर सकते हो अजादारा ने हुसैन जनाब जैनब ने यह खुतबा दिया था और ये एक चैलेंज था ला तम दिखरुना कि तुम खुदा की कसम हमारे जिक्र को हमारी याद को मोमिन के दिलों से खत्म नहीं कर सकते हो अजादारा ने हुसैन आप देखें खुद आपका वजूद आपके ये मजलिस बपा करना सदियों के बाद पूरी पूरी दुनिया में जाए आप किसी भी कॉन्टिनेंट में जाए आपको अक्सर जगह वो इदारे मिलेंगे जो जैनब के नाम से मंसूब हैं जैनबिया के उनवान से हैं और दुनिया के तमाम कॉन्टिनेंट में वो जिक्र होता है जो जैनब का जिक्र है जो हुसैन का जिक्र है जो अली का जिक्र है जो अहलबैद का जिक्र है बल्कि खुदा वंद आलम ने तो वो अजमत दी है जनाब जैनब को कि उनके नाम से सिर्फ एक मजार नहीं है बल्कि एक काहरा में है और एक दमिश्क में है ओलमा पे भी इख्तलाफ है कि असल मजार कहाँ पे है वो इस अख्तलाफ को आप छोड़ें खुदा वंद आलम ने जनाब जैनब को वो अजमत दी है उस बात उस नाम में इतनी बरकत है कि सुन्नी मजमा बहुत बड़ी तादाद में जाने वाली जो उस मजार में जो काहरा में है वो मेजोरिटी सुन्नी है लेकिन बड़ी तादाद में इसलिए जाते हैं कि उनकी हाजात कबूल होती है उस बारगाह में जो जैनब से मंसूब है और दमिश्क में भी शिया हजरात जाते हैं उसी उनवान से जहां जहां जैनब से मंसूब जगह हो गई है खुदा वंद आलम ने उसे अजमत और बरकत दी है ये जुमला के खुदा वंद आलम हमारे जिक्र को कभी खत्म नहीं करेगा ये इसलिए है कि जैनब ने भी कभी भी खुदा वंद आलम को जिक्र को भूली नहीं है अजदारा हुसैन आप सोच लें आशूर के दिन के मंजर को अपने जहन में रखें वो खातून जिनके खानदान के अठारह अफराद एक दिन में कत्ल कर दिए जाए भूख और प्यास के बाद जिसने अपने बेटों को भतीजे को और अपने खानदान अपने भाइयों की शहादत को देखा हो जिसने अपने भाई के गलू को कटते हुए देखा हो जिसने अपने भाई की लाश की पामाली को देखा हो उस पूरे दिन को गुजरने के बाद जब अहले हरम पर हमला होता है इनके असासे को लूटा जाता है इनकी चादरों को लूटा जाता है इनके खेमों को आग लगा दी जाती है उसके बाद वो भयानक रात आती है जिसे हम शाम गरीबा को अनुमान से याद करते हैं उस रात को अगर एक कोई आम इंसान होता और उस दिन अगर मगरब और इशा की नमाज भी पढ़ ले तो हम उसे सलाम करेंगे लेकिन चौथे इमाम की रिवायत मिलती है कि उस रात को भी शब ग्यारह मुहर्रम को तमाम मसाइब के बावजूद इमाम फरमाते हैं कि मेरी फुपी जैनब ने उस रात भी अपने नमाज शब को तर्क नहीं किया था अजदार हुसैन ये वो बहन है कि जब जैनब आख जब हुसैन आखिरी रुखसत के लिए आते हैं खेमो खेम गाँव में जाते जाते जैनब से एक मासूम इमाम जो सैद शबाब अहल जन्ना है वो बहन से दरख्वास्त करता है ला तनसानी 
يا اختا في صلاتك صلاه الليل اي بہن اس بھائی کو نماز و شب میں مت بھولنا چوتھے امام کی روایت ملتی ہے کہ اس پورے سفر میں شام تک ایک وہ مرحلہ بھی آیا کہ ہم نے دیکھا پھپھی جو ہے اپنی نماز جو ہے نافرہ کی بیٹھ کے پڑھتی ہے تو ہم نے کہا پھپھی جان یہ تو آپ کی عادت کی خلاف بات ہے کہتی ہے بیٹا ہم کیا کرے جو روٹیاں ملتی ہے اتنی کم ہے کہ ہم اپنے حصے کی روٹیوں کو بچوں میں تقسیم کر دیتے ہیں تمہاری پھپھی میں اب اتنی طاقت نہیں ہے کہ نافلہ نماز جو ہے کھڑے ہو کے پڑھ سکے ادارہ حسین یہ وہ زینب ہے کہ جس نے سب کچھ وف کر دیا اپنے بھائی کے لیے اپنی بچوں کی شہادت کو بھی گوارا کیا تاکہ شاید بھائی بچ سکے اپنی غم کو بھی وقف کر دیا حسین کے لیے زندہ نے شام میں جب جب مجلس کے لیے اجازت ملی جب سروں کا لا لا لایا گیا اس وقت دو سر آخر میں باقی رہے قریش کی عورتیں جو وہاں مقیم تھی وہ کہتی ہیں کہ لگتا ہے کہ یہ دونوں سر جو ہے ان جوانوں کے ہیں جن جو یتیم ہیں ان کی ماں شاید نہیں ہے جس پر زینب نے کہا تھا کہ انہیں یتیم مت کہو ان کے ماں باپ زندہ ہے یہ دکھیاری ماں ہے لیکن میں صرف اپنے بھائی کو یاد کروں گی ہمارے علماء کہتے ہیں کہ جب زینب مدینہ واپس پہنچی ہے اور روز رسول کی زیارت کے بعد رسول کو تسل تسلیت پیش کرنے کے بعد جب اپنے گھر جاتی ہے اور جب اس کمرے میں گئی جو دو بیٹوں کی کمرہ تھا جب ان کے سامان کو دیکھا ان کے مسلوں کو دیکھا تب پہلی بار زینب کو وہ دونوں بیٹے یاد آئے اس لیے کہ زینب نے اپنے غم کو بھائی کے لیے وقف کر دیا مصیبت سے نجات دے خدا جلد امام کے ظہور میں جی تاجل فرما ربنا تھا